Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode 62 of Blown Speakers. I'm Dave Henningman coming in from Yokohama, Japan. Uh, joining us again from Buffalo, New York is Greg Janko. Hello, Greg. Hey, Dave. And coming in from San Antonio, Texas, my little brother, Luke Henningman. How are you, Luke? Hi. Doing hey, great. Luke. It's great to be here. Hey. <laughs> And uh, yeah, Luke, uh, you selected it. You chose this album, I believe. Yeah, I did. And, um, yeah. And, um, so why yeah, yeah. why did you choose Raw Power? Well, if we're going to talk about like punk rock albums, hard rock albums, like whatever you want to call it, it is one of the greatest ones, you know. And um, it's actually the funny thing is, um, I heard Raw Power after I heard, like when I first got into Iggy Pop, it was like the early '90s. And his album American Caesar had come out. Mm -hmm. and, um, I guess one thing that always stays with me with that with that album is uh, that this was the time during the parental advisory sticker when that was just kind of getting started, and Iggy just kind of had to throw his own little spin in there and, and market parental warning. This is an Iggy Pop record, and I thought that was just genius. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I listened to that album a lot, and I mean, it just sort of stayed with me. And then uh, I remember just kind of finding this one. And it was not, it must have been 1997, you know, like when the uh, when the when the uh, um, when they re-released it, and you know, I found it just, and I was just like, well, let me check this one out. This looks like one of his original ones, and I mean, it was one of those ones I just couldn't stop playing it. I was just like, this is one of the greatest albums of all time, you know, and uh, and so because of that, and for a lot of other reasons, you know, I thought it'd be fun to do one on on Raw Power. Sure. Um, yeah, Greg, what are, what are your what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, qu quite an album. I mean, um, iconic album. Um, uh, highly touted by a lot of uh, the '80s and '90s punks. Um, I think it actually was. Like Kurt Cobain said it was his favorite album. Um, uh, Henry Rollins is, a, you know, has Search and Destroy tattooed on his back. Um, but I re I'm in such an iconic photo, too. Mm. Um, and I remember, I think, a buddy of mine in college, Scotty McKee, somebody I should look up, um, but he, in his record collection, he had Raw Power, I'm pretty sure. I remember one night in his, his dorm room going through his albums and it just caught me, you know, the, that image of Iggy Pop. Um, but I didn't hear it until, you know, after reading this book, which I was gifted with one birthday, um, mm -hmm. which gave me the backstory on, uh, on the so birth all, of... All three of us yes. have this book. It's, it's funny. <laughs> I didn't know Luke had Yeah, it. we do. Actually, mine because I'm still unpacking boxes from our move, and so it's in one of these boxes somewhere. But I do have it. Hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, this I mean, recommend this to anybody. Um, so the story of uh, American punk, and so I think I got the first one, uh, the eponymous first. Um, you know, with and love that, and then uh, raw power soon after, um, and um, it maybe didn't grab me as much as a well. It definitely grabs you, you know. But uh, um, I remember listening to Search and Destroy, and it just it was different. It really sounded different, and the mix was different than what I was used to hearing. But um, you know, it, it's it's quite amazing. Mm. you know yeah. i mean that's that's one of the best opening tracks ever you know yeah it really is i mean so that starts it off is just unbelievable mm. i mean it's just an explosion you know yeah yeah it's great <laughs> yeah iconic lyrics right the street walking cheetah with a heart pulling heart full of napalm <laughs> so, yeah. i mean the runaway scene of the nuclear a-bomb that's like one of the greatest lyrics in hard rock <laughs> ever <laughs> so it sounds uh pretty dangerous yeah and it's yeah. quite a strong um 
declaration of intent or what's the phrase I'm looking for? Uh, declaration of purpose or yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that sounded good. Declaration of intent. Mm. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, okay. So we got the, yeah, the iconic cover, of course. Um, let's see. But if you, yeah, so I wasn't sure because some of the albums have the name on. So I wasn't sure which one was the, the earliest one or, you know, which one I wanted to go with. But yeah, but I went with no, no name. Um, but some of these old vinyls have a sticker on that says Iggy. So it doesn't say Iggy and the Stooges. It just says Iggy Raw Power. And uh, yeah, Greg, I had the same thought that you did. That it must have been a few years later when some of his solo material was successful. And then the record company <laughs> went back and stuck these stickers on and put it out. Um, right. I, I think that's that's probably true. Um, and this is just, I, I don't know when they would have actually added the name. Maybe... Uh, for the CD or, man, I, don't know. I kind of think it's for the '97 one. Okay, could be. Yeah. So uh, I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Well, no, the the '90 because that's that's the one I have. The '97 reissue, and it's. Oh really? Uh -huh. Yeah. It has Iggy and the that's Stooges. The, the record. I, mean, I wonder if the uh, the CD I mean, was because yeah. I have it on CD and it does. Oh wait, never mind. Never mind. It does actually doesn't say it on the cover. Really? Um, okay. On the back. Huh. Yeah, they've got it on the back. Huh. It's um. Well, you know, it's cool with no words. <laughs> like it, like it yeah. doesn't need an explanation. Um, mm -hmm. especially considering it was it, it was such a flop when it, it initially came out. Um, I guess I'll um read that part in here. Um. I remember the page, but uh, yeah, Iggy talks about seeing it in a bargain bin. <laughs> I mean, all I knew was so he talks about when he, um, yeah, when he moves to New York and he sees all this going on. Um, uh, okay, I mean, all I knew was that Raw Power had been in the 39 cent bin at Irwin Brothers out in Los Angeles, and I thought, well, this is it, nobody cares. So um, I think, well, all right, when they were living in Los Angeles and then when he moved to, I guess there wasn't a lot going on out there um, musically. And then when he moves to New York and he sees this like scene kind of booming, um, mm -hmm. he starts to think that maybe the Stooges did make a difference, right? Because he's actually meeting people who are into the Stooges in New York. So, um, hmm. And out in LA, it's in the 39 cent band. So I don't know. That, that always stayed in my head. Just this um yeah. this album in the 39 cent band. But um yeah, but uh happily it was it's been it would be re-regarded, you know, as the the years went by, right? And like wide widely considered a a classic album, right? Definitely. Hmm. Yeah, and I wonder um well, it seems more, I mean, more, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, one of the templates for punk and more suited for, like, New York City or the Northeast than sunny California, or at, at least at that time. Do you remember why they were in California? I, um... Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, like, I should have reread re re uh, that part of the book, but... um. Well, they're originally from um, Michigan, uh, from the Ann Arbor area, right, Craig? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, do, do, do the first somehow I I don't I don't know if I listened to this album until I got to university, but growing up, I kind I kind of knew who Iggy Pop was. Like he was he was always kind of on the fringe of my like what I knew, like he would show up in magazines and stuff. And I wasn't, okay, like they never, when I was growing up, played Iggy Pop on the classic rock radio. Um, do you guys remember, did, did you hear any Iggy just through the normal? Well, camp? the very first exposure I had to him was uh, the video for Candy. Okay. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's like, of course, that's kind of, that's not really, I mean, it's a good song, but it's not like what you think of when you think of Iggy Pop. It's very radio friendly, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. But so, yeah, I've, I've never in my life heard, you know, raw power on, even today, I've never heard on a classic rock station. Huh. Um, no, yeah, talk, neither of I. radio stations, but, you know, but not on an actual, like, you know, classic rock station. Do they play any Iggy on classic rock stations? Like um, The Passenger or something? Yeah. Like Club I could see that, but I don't know. Yeah. Huh. I have been... Probably Lust for Life. Um, Lust right. for Life, yeah. I mean, of course, China Girl, he wrote, but Bowie's version is the more famous. And uh, you hear that on, on um, you know, classic rock stations. But, but yeah, I can't think of anything that's like Stooges that I've heard on, you know, a, a classic rock station myself. Like, well, yeah, when I was growing up, my knowledge of him was pretty spotty. But mm -hmm. pre-internet people. <laughs> pre-internet, yeah. Uh, um, but let's see, I remember, you remember um, when Metallica played on the Grammys the first time? And, you know, like at high school, like we thought that was a big deal. Like, well, Metallica's going to be on the Grammys. And they played uh, one, you know, and it totally kicked ass. And then the, the, the bands that were up for best metal performance, it was so weird. It was like Jane's Addiction, Metallica, Iggy Pop for something oh, really? Cold Metal. His, his album was called Cold Metal. And uh, Jethro Tull. And like oh, I have famous Jethro Tull won it, didn't they? They gave the award to Jethro Tull. And it was like a... You know, there was out that being an outrage in the metal world. Yeah, mm. right after Metallica played, it just kind of shows how little that the Grammy people knew what they were doing, right? Like they, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think Jethro Tull didn't even know they had been nominated or something. Like it was, you know, it was a debacle. But um, yeah, Iggy Pop was there because I remember they uh, they showed him sitting there. <laughs> um, <laughs> no <but> shirt. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I was in um, Subway. I was working in Subway. So it's about the same time, right? So I'm, I'm 16 or 17. And I had this album by this band. So at Subway, <laughs> the guy used to just let me play whatever I want. So I would just blast loud music the entire time I was working, <laughs> um, which I'm kind of surprised he let me do. But I had this uh, cassette by this band called Circus of Power that I had seen on uh, Headbangers Ball. Mm -hmm. And um, and the vocalist, yeah, I guess he's. I mean, I I wanted, Okay, well, Iggy Pop wrote a song on that album, so a song called "Crazy," that I I assumed they were covering Iggy Pop. But I was looking yesterday. Maybe somehow Iggy wrote that song for them. I I don't know the story, but um, but I'm just in in there one time, and this guy comes in and he's listening to certain you know the Circus of Power that I'm blasting, and he's like, "Is is this Iggy Pop?" <laughs> and I'm like. No, this is Circus of Power. And like no one had ever talked to me about Iggy Pop. I'm like, wow. And um, so I'm like, yeah. I, 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 and then he just started talking about Iggy Pop. He said, um, yeah, he's, do you know anything about Iggy Pop? And I'm like, I know the name, you know, and I know what he's, and he's like, yeah, he used to be in this great band. And then I don't know. I think he just does a bunch of drugs now. He looks awful. <laughs> He looks like a drugged out Mick Jagger. Like this guy's just telling me that's um I don't know, just some random guy <laughs> talking to me. <laughs> um, but um yeah, so um that was one reference point I had. But I yeah, I think it was like university when I really started listening to the Stooges. Uh perhaps. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. But it was that time when I was in university that was it a Nike commercial that used raw power or um, used um, right? search and destroy maybe? Right? Yeah, I remember. I don't remember that. Yeah, the uh, maybe around ninety seven or ninety eight. Okay, see that's that's I, or I think wait I th wasn't there a commercial that used nineteen sixty nine also? Um, uh, I don't uh, know. We're gonna have to look. You're gonna have to look it up. Um, <laughs> there was the one that I remember that was used 1969. Actually, had Iggy Pop in it. It was on MTV, and it was a right to vote, um, rock the vote, or whatever. Okay. Um, yeah. and it just had him and some girl said, "Iggy, are you gonna vote?" And he was like, "Yeah," you know. And then that was it, you know. But I don't know. <laughs> if 
I don't know if it was in any other commercial other than that, but hmm, hmm. But that's the only one that I can think of. And it was huge, you know, like that lust for life, you know, that was used in train spotting. I mean, that was a, a nice resurgence for him, right? I mean, that um, that soundtrack kind of took off, and um, oh I yeah, had a whole yeah. new generation of fans from there. Oh yeah. Hmm. Yeah, they, yeah, and they they use the song well in the movie with uh, with that 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 chase scene and yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course, he shows up in movies sometimes. He's in um, Dead Man. Uh, John mm -hmm. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah, that was great when he was in that. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I would. I would. Um, I mean, I, I, I imagine it's better for young people nowadays growing up with great, you know, access to, um, I mean, he's the kind of guy I think would uh, benefit from um, the internet because since they don't play him on the radio and you don't usually just happen to hear his music, you know, but, um, you know, anyone who listens to it loves it. So uh, I imagine kids that are so inclined are um, getting, into, getting into him rather easily nowadays, I would think. I would imagine so. I mean, especially since so many, uh, like, classic, like, punk and metal would reference him as, like, an influence. Mm -hmm. A lot mm. of kids would be like, let me Google Iggy Pop, you know? So, mm. and there has been a lot of that. Oh, I was going to go see him, though, my freshman year. So, at university, 90, 91. Um, I was planning to go down to Cincinnati, I think, to see him, but... Um, I remember I just decided not to, I just didn't have enough money. I'm like, oh, I can't go. And I think some of my friends went. But um, hmm. Yeah. So I was into him at that time. But um Yeah. I um I'm trying. Yeah, I never saw. Oh wait, did we... did I see Iggy Pop solo at actually with Steve, I think, at the um Oh yeah. You guys saw one my... uh yeah. At uh, the Fuji Rock, yeah. And you guys got on the stage. Well, well, then we, we got to see um, the reunited Stooges. Stooges um, uh, and we, um, at uh, the one in the winter. Was it winter? Uh, what was the other one called? Uh, Fuji, there's Fuji Rock and then... Uh, Summer Sonic. Summer Sonic. It was like a winter Summer Sonic. With um, yeah, we we got to meet uh, the Ashton brothers and oh. uh, and uh, I don't think and Mike Watt was there. Well, yeah, Greg, how did that happen? Because I I remember yeah, you guys yeah like Steve emailed me or something and said you were watching the Stooges like from the the wing of the stage or something. Like how did, well, how did you guys? That was that was. Uh, we were up we were up pretty close for the for the show. Um, but then we we just you know Steve and uh, <laughs> but one of the benefits at least at that time of being a uh, a foreigner in Japan and going to see you know uh, um, a rock band not from Japan that you could kind of have all access or if you just kind of pretended like you were going somewhere they weren't going to ask you. Pretend, like, gonna, pretend you're with the band, like we used to kind of. Yeah, do. basically, and then Steve's like, "Yeah, let's just work on here." Yeah, and uh, Steve's got a. Yeah, so we, we found ourselves backstage, and then uh, um, found ourselves in the Stooges dressing room, and uh, whoa, the uh, their manager was he was about my age. He was from Williamsville, outside of Buffalo, because I. I think I was talking to uh, Ron Ashton. He was a really friendly guy, <laughs> very down to earth. Hmm. Uh, you know, and I don't, maybe too, because he hadn't, you know, the Stooges hadn't tasted superstardom like, uh, you know, the Rolling Stones or Led Zeppelin or something. He was just kind of like, hey, how you guys doing? <laughs> you know, so thoroughly enjoying the, uh, you know, the arenas they were playing in and the, you know, the sellout shows and the recognition he was getting later in life. Um, so 
So I say, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, Buffalo, our manager's from Buffalo. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but, uh, and Mike Watt was sitting on the, cou- the couch um, and uh, it talked to Scott Ashton, uh, the drummer, for, for a while. He talked music and uh, it, was, it, it was fun. It was interesting. Um, and I told him I played drums and he said, I took a music class college and one professor I I had he said the first two beats any song you know from the first two beats mm. everything you need to know <laughs> wow. mm-hmm. I, I don't know if that's really true it certainly wouldn't be true for me someone of my modest skills um <laughs> but uh it was yeah it was noteworthy um and uh oh Steve McKay the uh the the saxophonist mm-hmm. who plays on Fun House was there. Huh. Yeah. So the lineup at that point, you got Iggy and the Ashton brothers and Mike Watt was playing bass and then uh, right. the saxophonist. Wow. Hmm. So that's, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Was- twice, twice in Japan? <clears throat> no, that just, um, just that one time. Okay. So how, how was the show? Um, yeah, it was great. Um, we're going back to 2000, uh, 2004, I think. I'm like, what, when they reunited? Um, yeah. Uh, God, I wish I could remember more <laughs> in particular. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite a show. Luke, Luke, have you ever seen him? No, I've never seen him live. I remember, uh, I was so annoyed with a coworker of mine because he was a big Pearl Jam fan. This is when I worked at Gale's Garden Center. He's a big Pearl Jam fan and he was going to see Pearl Jam at Blossom and he was like, the opening act is Iggy Pop. I was like, that just <laughs> seems blasphemous to me, you know? I mean, no disrespect to Pearl Jam, but it's just like, you know, they're, um, uh, you know, we're talking about an absolute legend that, you know, changed the history of rock and roll. And Pearl Jam's a grunge man, you know, they're good, but, you know, whatever. Um, and my friend said he was, Iggy was absolutely amazing. And I was just like, mm, that's just wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard, uh, yeah, people have said, I mean, people I know who have seen him perform, yeah, say it's amazing. And um, it's too bad. I, I mean, that's one of my, uh, <clears throat> one of the musicians I regret never seeing, right? Um, so I love the uh, the back cover. It's great. Uh, these uh, photos, uh, this photo especially, it, it, like to me, it looks like, um, <laughs> okay, like if, if um, you know, like the raccoons have been like getting in your trash, right? And you like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you hear That's some, a perfect description of it. <laughs> you hear some like you know commotion in the back. Oh, I'm gonna get those damn raccoons! And you like turn on the light, and like one of them looks at you like this. <laughs> <laughs> like he just he looks like such an animal. Um, yeah, that picture, right? Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, and he, even here, he he looks like a you know like a. A raccoon that's crawled up on your fence, right? Get off! My Look at, that, that pose is just amazing with his his left leg like that. Like he must be mm-hmm. double jointed. Like what a you know just uh, rubbery young man there in that pose. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like look at his left leg. I could never. Yeah, position myself even when I was so he's probably you know what about 24 or something and um could never uh position myself in that kind of pose it's funny mm-hmm. it, with his with his uh with his his um, chin in his hand there almost like kind of cavalier just casual looking around like, yeah mm-hmm. shirt off in the silver pants just looking around and um, and it looks like he's out in the crowd too. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and this jacket, right. right? So of course the the famous line, right? The street walking cheetah with a heart full of napalm. He 
Mm-hmm. And he talks about how he wrote that line. He said he had a cheetah jacket that he was wearing at that time. Um, so it's obviously this this jacket, right? Because it um, yeah, see the cheetah face. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So it's pretty clear that he was kind of um, running things at this point, right? So as we've said, um, the first two albums, okay, well, here I got, I got them handy, right? So the first album, 1969, The Stooges, um, and 1970, Funhouse, but both albums, uh, the name of the band is The Stooges, right? Mm-hmm. But for Bob Power, it's Iggy and The Stooges, right? So he he's really yeah. taken control of the band at this point. I mean... The fact that the back cover has four pictures of him, right? And um, mm-hmm. is this is this Williamson right here? I think. So there's yeah, no, that looks no pictures of the Ashton brothers, you know. So I mean, it's kind of telling. Um, yeah, he had. Um, well, um, is it okay. I referenced the book again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do yeah we, while, uh, while you're doing that, I should. Uh, yeah, for people who want to know, right? It's it is um, "Please Kill Me" by um, right the oral oral history of punk by Legs McNeil and Jillian McCain. Yeah, the classic of punk literature, I would say. Yes, Greg. And I think this is the uh, you know a few books now, a number of books now talk about the oral history of something. Like this is this maybe the first. It's the first book that I know of that is uh, refers to itself as the oral history of something. Mm. You're probably right about that. I like how it's structured. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, just very rich just snippets interview. of interviews, and then they they arrange them mm-hmm. so they uh, relate to one another, but often contradict or, uh, the people talking. Um, but I think Iggy Pop had met. You know, David Bowie came to New York City, and uh, you know, as he was beginning to try and uh, make a name for himself in New York City, and they went to um, he went to meet Andy Warhol and you know meet the people from the factory, um, as he was a big Velvet Underground fan and Andy Warhol fan. And then on that trip, he met um, Iggy Pop. He liked the Stooges as well. So um, he then got a deal with. David Bowie's uh, record company, um, Main Man. Mm-hmm. And I'll read, let's see, where was it? Uh, yeah, it mentions, I think it mentions Main Man. So I guess he was then, so James Williamson was kind of the, the new guy in the band someone prior to that. So he was closer with Iggy, maybe... But the Ashtons found themselves on the outs. And here's one quote. Uh, they, uh, he said he was the last guy at the Fun House, their, um, their residence in Ann Arbor, and the, the name for the second album. Then Ron Ashton says, uh, they split up the property we lived on in Ann Arbor after they tore down the Fun House. On part of it, they built a highway, then they put a bank on the other part. I was left with nothing. So one night I went into town and somebody said, there's a party at the SRC studio. So I went, Iggy and James Williamson were there. So I'm talking to Iggy and he says, oh yeah, by the way, I signed a deal. James and I are going to England. It was just like somebody punched me in the stomach or hit me over the head with a sledgehammer. I was flabbergasted because I thought eventually we would get back together again. I just walked out grabbed a tree and started crying for about a half hour. I was so dazed. I ended up walking home 15 miles in complete shock. Iggy was just so casual. Oh yeah, by the way, I just signed a deal. James and I are going to England. So, Mm. you know, well, I mean, they had had a, obviously they hadn't met any real, too much commercial success with their first two albums and, Mm. you know, um so it was a, a rough road but still uh ron ashton had taken it back there and uh and iggy pop was still just very determined to uh you know make a name for himself 
in the music business. Um, but then when they, so later, when he gets to England, uh, Iggy and James went to England and three months later, this was perfect Iggy. He calls me from London and says, well, we tried out a hundred drummers and bass players. We can't find anybody good enough. So how would you and your brother like to come over and play drums and bass? Well, of course I wanted to do it because it was something to do. <laughs> but just the way he said it, they tried everybody they could think of and then couldn't find anybody good enough. So the last choice is us, the original members. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. so. I wonder if Bowie pushed, like, I, I don't think Bowie would have been, all right, if he's a Stooges fan and he's like, all right, you know, why don't you guys come to England? And then uh, Iggy immediately sacks the two brothers, you know? Um, I don't think Bowie would have felt great about it. You know, so maybe Bowie um, somehow worked his magic to get Iggy to invite the Ashtons back. I don't know. <laughs> I'm always making up things. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> that would that would be that would be cool of um, David Bowie. I don't know. Uh, who knows? Mm. Um. Because I'm sure Bowie would have wanted the Ashtons there, wouldn't you think? I mean, if he's a Stooges fan, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you would think. Um, but well, there's some other quote in here, too, where the, someone uh, quotes in here um, how, just though, that how Bowie was really impressed with um, Iggy Pop. And so. You know, maybe um, he was just going to defer to whatever he said. Oh, but of course, then, you know, it does ultimately lead Iggy to becoming a solo artist. Yeah. So maybe, um, I don't know. <laughs> who, who knows what, what, yeah. what exactly. But, um, but uh, yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. They, they, yeah. So Iggy was definitely, um, in uh, creative control and mm. the main man with main man for this record. But uh, yeah, fortunately the Ashtons were a part of it because, um, you know, they uh, are integral to, uh, to this album. Mm. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it kind of makes me think of how like um, Ian Stewart, the uh, piano player for the Rolling Stones, who was originally, you know, a full-fledged member, and but when uh, I think when they became managed by what's his Andrew Lug Oldman, mm -hmm. he was out of the band because he didn't look the part. He didn't look like a rock star like the other guys. Hmm. Um, but he still stayed in the band. He said, "Well, you know, I'll play with you guys on on sessions on on records, but." And I think eventually he plays with them on tours and concerts, but he's not, mm. you know, featured as a full-fledged member. He's not, you know, photographed on albums. And and Keith Richards said, wow, you know, in his memoir, he talks about what a humble guy he was and what a humble, you know, move that was that he said, oh, I still want to be involved with the band, even if I'm not, you know, recognized as a full member. So kind of have to... I, I kind of think of Ron Ashton in the same way here where, you know, he's originally a guitar player and yeah, dissed by I Iggy, like, oh, I'm going to London, see you later. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah, I can't find anybody better. You want to come over and, you know, and he's not even playing guitar. Yeah. 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 So now he's on bass, even though he played, but, uh, he played guitar on the first two albums. Right. But on the, the third. Yes, album, yeah. Um, uh, it's funny when you were talking about the Stones. That that's how they treat their bassist now, right? That Daryl Jones is that his name? Um, I th I think so. Yeah, like I mean, he's never photographed with them or anything. Like I mean, um, yeah, you're right. I mean, Bill Wyman left like a long time ago, right? Like um, '90s or something. I I don't know, but um, <clears throat> yeah, it's been a while. Um, so let's see. So this, of course, here this is Iggy, the front man, Iggy Pop. The godfather of punk, he's referred to in uh, circles. He's wearing his cheated, his infamous cheetah jacket here. 
Okay, this is James Williamson on the left. I don't know a lot of what about what he's done outside of um, musically outside of the Stooges, right? I mean, this is by far his most high profile album. Isn't, isn't that correct? Or, um, yeah. And uh, he famously, after he retired from rock, he became a very successful uh, businessman in Silicon Valley. Is that right, Greg? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he became a normie, all right? <laughs> a normie. Yeah. Um, and this, okay, so this is Ron, right? This is Ron Ashton. As we said, guitarist on the first two albums, bassist on the third, and this is his brother, Scott Ashton, uh, the drummer. Right. Um, well, might be a good time to, to play a track, try and play a bit of a track. What do you guys think? I think so. OK, we're, we're going to play a bit of the opening track, right? The iconic Search and Destroy. We've already mentioned a couple of times. Um, I mean, really one of the greatest opening tracks in uh, music history, I would say. <laughs> Definitely. Cheater with a hat full of napalm. I'm a runaway son of the nuclear A-bomb. I am a world's forgotten boy, the one who searches and destroys. Radiation in the dead of night Love in the middle of a fire of fire Quite a tune. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about it is just amazing. I mean, you're just a beginning guitar riff. You just get those power chords at first. They're just nice and and they're so simple. And then you just they throw in that other riff. And I mean, it's just amazing. The lyrics and just everything about that song is perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just one of the greatest rock and roll anthems ever written. Mm -hmm. The attitude. I mean, Iggy's the attitude. Iggy's attitude is just bursting out of there. It's right? almost like the uh, you were talking about the raccoon face on the back. It's almost like that song, like is like that face, you know, kind of represented <laughs> in lyrical form, you know. Uh, <laughs> I even feel like that. Jerry, it even looks like. Does he have? Like when you just look at it, it looks like he has like the garbage or filth on his mouth. Like when, like like a like a raccoon who would have been like eating your garbage. Um, <clears throat> and it, I also think that's one of the intriguing things about the um, relationship with David Bowie and Iggy Pop is like, I mean, Bowie is just all about this grandiose image. You know, I remember I was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame years ago, and I was looking at you know some of the costumes that were on displays um like stage outfits and there was bowie and it was just this big thing you know i think it was those pants that have the that kind of like stick out on the side and they're like striped you know it's just a oh, yeah. big glammy sort of outfit and then a little bit further down there was a iggy pop uh <laughs> stage outfit and it was a pair of cut off jeans that were duct taped on the crotch mm. <laughs> it's like these two created some of the most 
iconic music of all time and they could not be any more different as far as their image was concerned <laughs> mm. yeah that's true yeah. and then white duke very sophisticated i mean <laughs> quite a contrast to this um the street walking yeah. cheetah. <laughs> <laughs> street walking cheetah slash raccoon yeah yeah <laughs> street walking <laughs> cheetah slash garbage eating raccoon um what was your uh you had an anecdote you're gonna hit us with right oh um I, um i was just thinking of that guitar that guitar i mean like you said luke those uh, those kind of power chords start you know it's just a a uh, blistering rhythm but when that lead guitar comes in and the way it's it's just like you're like blindsided you know and uh i think that's what i was referring to earlier when I first heard this album, and this is the first track, Search and Destroy, I don't think I'd ever heard, you know, a rock and roll song, a rock song with that kind of guitar that just like comes in and like, you know, blindsides you like that, you know, and it's so, so high in the mix, like so loud, it's, yeah. Um, oh, um, and that's, I guess, um, Oh, we were talking about the different mixes because when this 97 uh, reissue came out yeah um I, I i i probably only got this though about six years ago or something but there's um you know iggy pop had said he was never pleased with the original mix that david bowie had um had produced um or no it says originally let's see produced by iggy pop for main man mixed by david bowie and iggy pop but iggy pop was never uh, satisfied with the original mix and then so for this 90 97 reissue re-release he um remixed the album and you know so when i got this one and, and read about that i was like oh i'm i'll have they you know, comes with both. So I was like, okay, I'm going to listen to them. And I, I guess I was expecting more of a, um, you know, and I, I remember, yeah, um, well, I was expecting more of a significant difference. And I, I hear there's a difference, but I didn't hear a major, major difference, you know, I mean, and I remember talking to a, a guy here in Buffalo about that one, like, oh, you know, I got that reissue and you know they talk about a different mix and iggy pop re you know this is the original this is the way it really should be uh heard this is the way he intended the music to be heard i'm like eh, doesn't sound that different <laughs> mm. Mm. um it, so it sounds a bit juiced up doesn't it the um yeah i mean yeah. there is yeah there, it seemed it, it pumped up a little bit and mm. definitely like the um I think the rhythm section and the, the bass and drums are beefed up a little bit. Mm. Um, but it's not, I mean, you know, if I had to do a blind uh, listen, um, not a taste test, but a, uh, mm. a hearing test, I'd, I'd have a hard time telling the difference. Um, yeah, same here. I mean, I've, I've thought that before too. I mean, I've, I've noticed a few things like the way that, Search and Destroy ends. Um, you can see there's a difference between the original and the new one. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm, I'm in the same boat with you. There's just a few things that I'm just that I noticed. But like, yeah, a lot of it's like, yeah, I mean, they're both amazing. <laughs> mm. But producers, so I guess. Yeah. Part. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I tend to lean. I mean, so like just now, I played the original Bowie. Uh, um, yeah. The Bowie mix. I mean, if I have to choose, I'm going to go with the. Um, the 1973 one i mean just um of course i mean i like you know B bowie produced um lou reed transformer right that's one of my favorite albums you know just um shortly before that i mean i have ultimate respect for him as a producer and, and i think the original raw power sounds amazing you know so i don't i don't know i guess it, i mean i understand why i guess iggy would want to do that if you really felt um was Bowie insulted that 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 um Iggy did that all those years later or 
don't yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I'm probably <clears throat> not. You know, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, I mean, nice. yeah, he seemed pretty pretty busy with his own career. Yeah, you know. I mean, I know and they did a feuds over the years, but was that when Earthling came out? Like the David Bowie album, I think that was the one with "I'm Afraid of Americans." That was a pretty uh, big hit. It's around that time, yeah. He might have, yeah. I think it was around that time, so he may have just been doing his own thing with that. Yeah. Um, hmm. But I wouldn't like to see this happen too often. That people are, you know, remixing classic albums. I don't know. I'm kind of against the idea, but um, yeah, and it happens a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I hear people saying, oh, did you hear the new remix of the White Album or whatever? You know, there's, um, and even if you like put on Spotify or whatever, it'll say like 2017 remix of, you know, whoever it is that you're listening to. So there's a lot of remixing going on these days. Um, so speaking of Spotify, when I listened to um, Rob Power yesterday and then um, it just went on to the another album and it's a live recording of the Stooges from um, around this time. It might have even been 72, but you could, um, but they're playing these songs, some of these songs, but the, the audience, um, it, it sounds like the audience isn't really buying it. So, I mean, that, that image of raw power in the 39 cent bin is very much in my head, you know, not, um, not as, you know, not being critical of the band. It's more to critical of just the, they were ahead of their time, right? And um, pe people yeah. weren't, just, weren't especially digging it for what, but listen to this performance. It sounds like um, Iggy's just pissed at the crowd. I think it was in Georgia. And he's that, just, he's screaming. Metallic KO, is that the, uh, is that the album? I, I don't know. It just started playing. Um, and he screams yeah. at some guy. I, I could probably find it if I look at um, Yeah. That was the live album that came out with the Stooges. I don't know what year it came out, but okay. Um, but yeah. Do you know what what year the recording was? Um, no, not off the top of my. I used to have it. I don't know what happened to it, but um. But yeah, that was um. It was kind of like you were saying, you know, it, that he was, people were throwing things at the stage, and Iggy was kind of <laughs> being like, "Now we're getting violent," you know, and things like that. Yeah, sort of totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like, that's um yeah. at a biker club though in in Michigan, like. Towards the end of yeah, the, the, the Metallic KO because that's pretty okay. um all right pretty yeah that's that's the one that I was mentioning so, yeah yeah but okay so I'm been. wrong about I could be wrong about Georgia or there could be more than one so there could sure, be more yeah. than one yeah, that's, that, that's yeah. the, that was the one that was actually like produced or whatever but I mean I'm sure there were recordings that came out later you know that were yeah. that were there so. But what is what I thought was interesting, I mean, especially for a live album, I mean, it just sounds like the audience d doesn't like what's going on, what's going on. And it's uh, and he's he's pissed off. He um, he calls someone a cracker at some point. He's like, why don't you come up here and I'll punch you in your cracker mouth or something like that. Like it, it sounded pretty pissed off. And at one point you could hear a woman's voice like, I don't I don't think he likes us like something like like just, you know. <laughs> like just regarding him as you know more of a freak show than a band it felt like just the comments you would hear here and there i mean it's just interesting considering um you know there's such a revered legendary band that um they really were not getting a lot of love back in the day in certain areas right yeah yeah well yeah, well, it's oh, pioneers. I mean, you know, it's, it sounds like a cliche, but you know, they're blazing a trail, um, and it's you know, I mean, somewhat extreme music too. I mean, they're not <laughs> looking to endear themselves with with people. I mean, if people aren't into it, you know, mm. they're not going to uh, really. Um, I don't know, make it more palatable, I guess. Well, I do remember a story from Please Kill Me where uh, he was, you know, all dunked up or drunk or whatever, and he came up on stage and just said, you people make me sick, and just barfed all over the all over the crowd. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, that's he was more going for things like that. He was more going for shock value or, you know, whatever. Or, of course, he was pretty doped up when he did that. Mm -hmm. But, like, um, and I remember, read another interview. I forget where it was in, but um, 
where uh, the crowd kind of went after him because he took a bottle and smashed it across the uh, microphone stand and a girl in the front got cut. And so like, as soon as that happened, like, you know, people were like rushing the stage trying to kick his ass, you know? So like, I mean, like you said, he wasn't trying to, you know, get people to love him. You know, he's trying to be crazy and excel. Like, he was basically, Johnny Rotten got away with things like that because of Iggy Pop. You know, there's a story that uh, Johnny Rotten, like a kid asked for his autograph and Johnny Rotten spit on the record and the kid was like, wow, thanks, you know? <laughs> um, so like that, that eccentricity, you know, of, uh, of, you know, just being pissy like that. I mean, that really was, was Iggy. It's just a lot of people uh, copied it afterwards. Mm. I mean, when you read this book, I mean, he, you know, because so many people in the book die, right? I mean, it's, it's Johnny Thunders, yeah. et cetera. Um, but the one guy who you're amazed that lives throughout it is, is Iggy Pop. I mean, there's yeah. so many stories where it sounds like, God, he could have died there. Um, so yeah, he was, uh, he's very yeah. off the rails, but he is, he's a, he's a survivor somehow. He's still yeah. alive. <laughs> he's still going. I think he's still touring. But he, he does, they talk about in that, did you guys see the, the documentary on the Stooges by, um, Jim Jarmusch? No, I'd love to see that, but yeah, no, I haven't seen it yet it's, either. It's, yeah, it's good. Um, but so I don't, um, I guess, so when did this album is 1974? Three, Raw Power. 73. Yeah. And then, so this is their last album. Mm -hmm. as the Stooges, even now. Yeah. The Stooges. But so after that, I think he goes, um, you know, and then they have a real tumultuous end in, in Los Angeles. Um, but he, you know, cleans up, goes into some sort of rehab. So he must be pretty young at that time. And then stayed, you know, stayed off heroin from that point on, you know. So, you know, clean himself up. I, th I mean, through the, and then makes those albums with David Bowie, you know, Lost for Life, The Idiot. And then he has a pretty mm -hmm. um, stable career through the 80s. So. But you know, I think he, he was pretty professional after that. After you know, after he cleans up, he's pretty professional, even though he's still, you know, a vital artist and you know, passionate on stage. But I think things like cutting himself on stage or uh, you know, being a functioning uh, you know addict or just you know the, the the wildness had toned down as far as you know extreme behavior, dangerous extreme behavior. But um, but that the Berlin period you mentioned, right, with hanging out with uh, Bowie and Lou Reed. I mean, wasn't that a pretty druggy time, or no? Well, I think um, he got off heroin. I mean, it, yeah. pretty obvious. Lust for Life is a uh, is like a a rehab. I mean, the opening track is, of course, all about uh, you know, getting his life back in order. Um, and I think he's did pretty well with the heroin. But I mean, he definitely used and abused a number of times over the years you know um i saw an interview with him and that was in like 86 or something and he was pretty obviously trashed in it um but i think it may have been i mean it may have been alcohol or or pot or something like that but like um but yeah so i mean I, he it took him a long time to completely clean up but you know i mean you can tell in lust for life that he's you know working towards that at least um but i think he kind of fell off a few times over the years too Hmm. Yeah. Well, he pulled through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, what other uh, tracks? Okay. Um, yeah, I think I've I've introduced the band. I believe. Um, all right. So we played a bit of "Search and Destroy," right? The iconic opening track. So how about side A of this album? Right. You got "Give Me Danger." Um, I mean, that's one of the greatest second tracks of an, of an album. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and that's interesting how it's just, uh, yeah, very different, uh, uh, you know, mood than uh, Search and Destroy. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking today as I was listening to that, it was reminding me of that Sex Pistols song, um, Submission. Mm-hmm. 
um, which is probably not so coincidental. Um, and it says he plays piano on that one. Um, but yeah, more of a, it's got, you know, it's just a, um, yeah. you know, more of, a, you know, just mid tempo. Uh, I've got more of a groove, uh, but it's it's pretty hypnotic. I think it's interesting the vocal range between the first two songs. Like uh, "Search and Destroy" definitely goes very high, you know, like "I'm the Street Wild and Cheetah," you know, like his, his yeah. voice goes very high. But he also has this deep low that's just very melodic, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and he uses it's interesting how he balances those. But like in in "Give Me Danger," there's just a, "Give Me Danger, Little Stranger," and it's like. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like, is that even the same person? You know, like, um, his range is unbelievable on this. Well, not just on this album, but just throughout his career. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I think, um, you know, he talks about in the book, Please Kill Me Too, seeing uh, Jim Morrison and being a fan of Jim Morrison. So, it, you mm -hmm. know, kind of brings to mind some of uh, the vocal range of, the Lizard King. Yeah, it's definitely very obvious that Iggy yeah. Pop was influenced by Jim Morrison there. Um, would you Would you want to play some of that? Like that? Oops, sorry. Oh, I just said when he goes low like that. So. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's yeah, and it's cool. It's um, you know, it. I think it's. I mean, for any album that I like, I like some stylistic variation. You know, mm -hmm. not that the it, you know something that's inauthentic but he's still they're still doing it well it's still a you know a cool uh, rock and roll song but it's got a different uh different tempo different uh different feel to yeah. it would you want to play some of that dave sure give me danger um definitely yeah and as you said it, it's the name of the jarmish documentary right give me danger <laughs> you're right yeah that's right um i watched you know how pitchfork has that um a liner notes series, those little kind of five minute. Um, oh yeah, I, I like that. I wish they would have done more of those. But um, yeah, there there is one for raw power, and I guess um, part of the deal with Columbia. So um, Bowie did Bowie hook up the Columbia contract to some degree, or uh, I think. Um, yeah, that's. Um, I'm assuming he did. It was through his. Was it through his management? Maybe his management was called Main Man, and then they, and they, they secured a record deal. So another example of Bowie using his powers for good. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, he was very. So we we did an episode about uh, Devo a few episodes back, and yeah, he was he was a big part of breaking Devo too. So. Oh really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So he got Devo. I, I knew that. He got Devo over to Germany to record in Connie Plank's studio with um, Eno. Eno ended up producing that first album. Oh, that's I, right, yeah. I think Bowie was supposed to produce it, but it somehow turned out to be Eno. But um, yeah, um, Bowie wow. hooked the whole thing up, right? Just these um, kids from Akron, you know, the next thing they know, they're in Germany being produced by Eno. I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, so this has that kind of feel to it, too, that he's taking kind of you know, a rather obscure band, you know, over to um, England and hooking them up with uh, the right people and, and all that. But, um, do, 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 low, okay. But what I was going to say, what they mentioned in that um, Pitchfork thing is that uh, because it's Columbia, the Stooges had to agree to have a ballad on each side of the album. <laughs> so give me, give me Danger is considered a ballad. Give me Danger is <laughs> a ballad. <Yeah. laughs> And oh my god, that's great! <laughs> and um, what would be the one from? Oh, I think maybe I, I need, need somebody, I need somebody. Maybe. yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let's listen to a bit of a uh, uh, give me danger. Okay, we're gonna play a bit of track two, give me danger. Danger, little stranger, and 
I'll feel you are feel Give me danger, little stranger And I'll feel your disease There's nothing in my dream Just some ugly memory Kiss me like the ocean breeze Now if you will be my lover, I will shiver and sand. But if you can be my master, I will do anything. There's nothing left alive but a pair of glassy eyes. Raise my fears one more time. Such a great track. Yeah, it's kind of listening right now. I was kind of thinking. I, I imagine that uh, that song in particular had a big influence on Danzig because I was noticing how much uh, Iggy's voice kind of has that feel of uh, you know the Misfits almost, and, and that was what seventy seven. The, their first album came out. Misfits. Um, I, they were doing stuff guys about that time, but I. Oh, can you hear me? Look, um, the Misfits might have been releasing singles. At yeah, it broke me seven. Yeah, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I, I could see that totally. And you could see that he was influenced by Morrison to a degree, right? You call it a, mm -hmm. a baritone, the low, hmm. the low vocal. Yeah, that'd a be baritone, a baritone. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Danzig mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, that's a good, good reference point, and I think a good observation, Luke. That. Yeah, the Danzig had, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Elvis <laughs> could could do that as well. Mm -hmm. Frank Sinatra. Um, yeah, it's uh, he's almost crooning at times. Yeah. The the guitar sounds amazing. Uh, that acoustic guitar, it, it does. It's pretty yeah. pretty intricate. Mm-hmm. And then that that backing piano gives it a a little different um, flavor. Yeah, a nice uh, nice detail in the back. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, not afraid to uh, to to uh, to get dark with the lyrics. Uh, nothing in my dreams, but. Ugly memories. Um, it's pretty bleak. But then he, <laughs> and then he, then what's the name? Kiss me like the ocean breeze, though. That's a little more uplifting, and I guess more of a, uh, more of something that would be suited for a ballad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, he pulled it off, you know. Yeah. I mean, like made a pretty dangerous sounding ballad yeah uh, <laughs> you know it just occurred to me that um you know for my graphic that i use you know at the beginning of each episode i say uh, a program a program for mass liberation in the form of an album discussion vlog right um no one's ever <laughs> commented on that but i, I took that from uh, lester banks right so I think it's in that book, Carburetor Dung, I think, but he has um, a program for mass liberation in the form of a Stooges album review, right? So he oh. he was crazy about the Stooges, right? Mm. Then he, was it Funhouse? Like he he didn't like when he first heard it, and I think he wrote like a negative review of it, and then like a week later, he wrote some big long thing, like, you know, retracting everything he had said and like 
It, yeah. singing singing its praises and yeah so he was uh lester banks is pretty uh pretty passionate about the the stooges right so um yeah like what, what was it one of his longest reviews he ever wrote was on raw power like wasn't it like like i think it was three like two or three issues wasn't it then that, that he was raving about raw power could be could be i i, I had the idea especially fun house was super long but i mean he might he might have gone crazy about both both of them or all of them um mm -hmm. but it's great that he could just get so emotional about it that he was so distraught that he didn't like funhouse at first and then like, <laughs> like um you know the effect that it, it's like uh he's almost being tortured by the music um but then um ultimately gushes about it i mean it's pretty it's pretty amazing um yeah exactly should have should have looked up some of those quotes, but yeah, um, yeah, I'd recommend reading uh, Lester Bangs. Um, what Lester Bangs has to say about the Stooges. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I'm looking for my copy now. Oh, here it is. Well, you guys can continue. All right. Well, look while while Greg is doing that, what are your thoughts on uh, your pretty face is going to hell? Um. Well, first of all, that's the name of that song just grabbed my attention, right? When I bought the album and I just started cracking up because I just like, this is genius, you know? Like, um, But again, there's a vocal that he uses, you know, where it just gets really high and raspy. And he uses it somewhat on, on Death Trip too, on the last track in the vinyl. Um, but I mean, it's the same thing. It's just the first three songs, just the vocals, he just keeps reinventing, you know? And there's not very many people that do that. Hmm. you know um so that's certainly one thing that stands out in in that song and uh i mean just that tell your pretty face is going like you know i can't stand you but i also kind of like you <laughs> you know like i mean I, I think we all get that you know like when uh just in the title of the song and um again just incredible lyrics you know and, and incredible just like a um pretty face and a dirty look knew right away i have to get my hooks in you or something it's just like it's just like, yeah, I, I, we all get that, <laughs> you know. Mm. Um, what about you? What are some of your thoughts on that song? Uh, yeah, that line you just mentioned, get the hooks in. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's cool. Um, mm -hmm. How about uh, penetration? I, I guess that, that would <laughs> that would win a horniest song on the album, I suppose. <laughs> it would. But it's also one of the most beautiful, like melodic, you know, like the uh, um, the instrumentation. I can't even place what that instrument is. That's you know, it's almost like it almost sounds like a xylophone or something. Oh, um, I think it's Celesta that's, that's playing on that song. And um, yeah, the uh, Celesta. I don't. I can't even picture what that looks like. Celesta. Is. Yeah, oh. it's. Uh, I, I have no idea what a Celesta is, but you know, um, I mean, it's just this. Who would have thought? You know. That that would have worked on on such like a, a overtly sexual song, you know. Um, that's very heavy in a lot of ways, but it has this lovely little bell sound, you know, <laughs> jingling in the background, you know. Um, it's so, yeah, a, another incredible track. An orchestral percussion instrument resembling a small upright piano consists of a series of small metal bars. Is the mm. uh, Celesta or spelled celeste greg you found your lester banks book there i did yep here's the uh, oh i think psychotic i psychotic reactions and carburetor dong is that the one you have yeah 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 i read i think i read it when i lived in chicago um, um i don't no, it, it seems a lot of these reviews are after this though okay so he just Oh wait, here we go. Of, of pop and pies and fun. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. A program mm -hmm. for mass liberation in the form of a Stooges review review. So that's that's the phrase I took. For, <laughs> yeah, that's included in the the intro. Um, yeah. yeah. Can you uh, can you see that? Yeah, 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 mass liberation. Now, what album is he talking about there? Is it is Funhouse or Rob? I think he's 
just talking about, no, I think the first. Oh, the first one. The yeah. eponymous. Hmm. Oh, the, the Stooges, the first album? Yeah. John Cale produced it, right? Yeah. Wait, who, who produced the second one? Do we know? Um, <laughs> not the top I'm line. sure people could easily find that on, um, on Wikipedia. How about the... Um, so I noticed that Iggy and James get all the songwriting credit on this album. Is it like that on the other two albums? Do the Ashtons get... I'm just wondering oh, this, if, if the Ashton is writing credits to the first two. Uh, Funhouse is, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, here for Funhouse. Yeah. Um, all selections written by the Stooges. Yeah, so that's what I was wondering. So the, the that means the, the Ashtons and... Um, Dave Alexander was the other guy, right? They called. Mm -hmm. You might want to, Craig, you might want to take the record out and look because sometimes it says something different on the actual record than it does on the jacket. About the. Uh... About who wrote it. Because sometimes they'll say all tracks written by the Stooges on the back of the record. And then when you look at the actual record, it says, you know, specific people. Let's see. <laughs> I can get it. On Electra. Well, I mean, that's just another example of how yeah. it seems that Iggy is really taking control of the band yeah. at this point, right? That the Ashtons aren't getting yeah. any, any songwriting. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, there's nothing different on the record that I can mm. see here. Okay. Just thought it'd be um, wonderful. Um, it says produced by Don Gallucci. Wow. Don Gallucci. Who's that? <laughs> I don't know. Um, here, I mean, there Iggy is, uh, see that, like there's his face and then mm -hmm. yeah, I always inside love the there's him, oh. like his head is inside his, um, mm -hmm. here's his larger face here and then inside. Yeah. It's great. Oh, yeah. Smaller image. But mm. look at this, uh, this gatefold. So yeah, here. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah, they're. Uh, it's pretty cool. Together as a band, and then on the back cover, the uh, the Ashtons and Alexander get some mm. some mm -hmm. recognition. Yeah. Before Iggy became the main man, um, yeah, I don't know who Don Gallucci is. I'm sure and, um, our, our, some of our viewers know. And now, was yeah. Alexander was kicked out of the band after? Funhouse? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, and they mentioned that in "Please Kill Me." I think he had a, uh, I don't know, he had he had an off night, and they said um, basically Iggy Pop kicked him out of the band. I, we'd have to look in the book. Mm. All so, right. Well, let's um, let's see. What do we, Greg? Yeah. Greg, do you have uh, you have thought on uh, track three or track four from side one? Your um to hell. penetration yeah um oh and <laughs> what do they say about your pretty face is going to hell originally titled hard to beat hard to beat yeah huh. well, why would they uh, that's funny they put that in there like would, mm -hmm. would that <laughs> would that prompt someone to to buy the album who wasn't already like oh it did no it's hard to beat Oh, you mean it's it's written on the album that it was originally yeah, titled? Yeah, in parentheses, originally titled Hard to Beat. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why that not funny. saying that? Yeah, I remember noticing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah, those, um, I guess of, uh, of those two, um, Penetration um, might be one I... Uh, I would I would go to, um, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, n nothing to add at the moment uh, from what you guys said. All right, we're gonna flip it over. Look at side two, right? The title track "Raw Power" um, has a bit of a Velvets feel to it. The the music, right? Wouldn't you say? I I would say so. Yeah. Hmm. 
Um, that's, I don't know. I wasn't just, um, but it's so, it's so like guitar heavy, mm -hmm. like a real metallic KO. I don't know. I would, um, that doesn't jump to mind for me, but I'd like, do you want to play some? And All right. Let's, uh, all right, we'll play a bit of the title track. Okay, we're going to play a bit of the title track, Raw Power, track one, side two. such a good track groove. yeah <laughs> groove. that groove makes me think of the velvets right and i think mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. when we talked about um modern lovers i think it's the same thing there's a certain velvets groove sister mm -hmm. ray-esque groove um yeah that we could see. yeah it's just one of the things that i it's so ridiculous but just the thing that gets that track going is iggy grunts at the beginning you know it's just Ugh. and then you just hear the guitar riff and it's just like I don't know why. It probably was accidentally recorded, but it seems to set the stage for the song in a weird sort of a way. You're just sort of like, okay, he just grunted, you know, <laughs> what's going to happen next, you know? And that riff is just unbelievable. And that opening line, dance to the beat of the living dead. You know, I mean, it's like, it's just such a great first line to just pull you into the, to the song, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. And I, I love that. Uh, well, maybe well, the heavily distorted guitar in, in line with the velvets, um, and that uh, what the Celesta. That was that. Mm -hmm. Those kind of it kind of mimics the guitar, but it's like those kind of eighth notes that did it did it did kind of mm -hmm. like um, uh, is that I'm waiting for the man where it's. Da, 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 and you hear it on a lot i think of like kind of early rock and roll where it's like um, the piano is really used as a percussive instrument kind mm. of like the hi-hat like little richard like yeah yeah mm -hmm. um so yeah i see what you're saying dave and uh um yeah luke uh and uh and then those that opening line is great so they, I think I mean, we all give it a thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I like the, the high-pitched percuss percussion, right? Like we've talked about a few times here. Um, but then on the first album, what, what's the track that uses the uh, sleigh bells, or the jingle bells? Um, well, um, it's one of the I want to be. I want to be your dog. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just those those little touches give mm -hmm. you know they add so much to it. Um, and that's something, you know, like, I'm going to, I'm just makes me think of things like, you know, I, I mentioned Henry Rollins before and here's, we're not getting paid for any of this product placement. Um, I got this from the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library, State Fanatic, Henry Rollins, um, obsessing over, oh, then, you know, this is, look, it's signed. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, signed. Huh. Um, but Henry Rollins, a huge Stooges fan. And, um, but I think like a lot of the bands influenced by the Stooges, are, you know, they're proto punk. A lot of the punk bands that came later, it makes me, you know, Henry Rollins was in Black Flag, a hardcore band. But th those kind of touches, you know, don't surface on a lot of those band's records, you know, like it was mm -hmm. kind of lost. Like obviously the guitar, you know, was a big imprint and um, and, and something you see in, in punk bands and later bands, but some of those subtle touches, you know, you, you don't hear as often. Or it makes me think of Led Zeppelin too, or like Led Zeppelin or even Black Sabbath as influential metal acts, but then the metal, not the, you know, and some go into other territories, but often, I think the um, the well-known acts later miss some of the uh, the subtleties, the nuances. Mm. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I because yeah, I can't think of another punk band that exactly does that. You know, like that kind of high-pitched percussion <laughs> throughout the song, right? Um. Do, do, do. Okay. Um, all right, Luke, what are some of your thoughts on the uh, the other three? We got I Need Somebody, it's a uh, ballad, <laughs> Shake Appeal, and mm -hmm. Death Trip. Yeah, and obviously that's the, um, yeah. Um, you know, I Need Somebody, obviously he does kind of slow it down a little bit, but it's still, still hard, you know, it still has, um, I mean, it's, it's still very edgy, um, but yeah, it's a quote-unquote ballad. <laughs> You know, um, and and shake appeal. You know, just uh, I mean, just really gets you and grabs you in in a, in a really intense way. You know, and it's it's one of the shorter ones. And then I, I think I'd have to say my favorite track on the on the album is Death Trip. You know, um, just something about the vocals, um, very similar in his vocal stylings to Pretty Face is Going to Hell. You know, he he goes very high and um, and um, he draws it out a little more in that one. Like, you know, he, um, it reminds me in some ways of, of my favorite track off of Fun House, which is Dirt, you know, where it's just sort of like, um, where he just kind of like carries the same very simple idea and just, um, like leaves it there for a long time. Um, and that's one thing that I think is very cool about Death Trip. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, that's, um, that's just a few things on, on those couple of tracks. So, Greg, you've said, uh, well, one of these is your favorite track off the album. So, uh, would you yeah, like to? Um, cl close, um, it's in close proximity to, to Luke's choice. Um, number, it's uh, number three, though, uh, Shake Appeal. I just, it's such a, such a rocker. Um, mm -hmm. Just uh, straight ahead rock and roll song, but... Uh, you know, it's uh, it's not Jerry Lee Lewis or, or Little Richard or Elvis Presley. It's you know, it's it's its own thing. But uh, it's great, and and I yeah, I think this really is to me like a real proto punk song, kind of setting the template for um, you know, um, maybe the uh, the Ramones or the Damned or whoever. Uh, came later. I, yeah, I love that song. And uh, yeah, I was thinking as we were, as I was listening to the record and thinking of things, of talking points, I was like, yeah, I love Shake Appeal. Um, if I were ever to find myself in a Stooges tribute band, I would lobby for Shake Appeal as the name of the band. But then a little internet research revealed um members of the band Swerve Driver were in a uh, a band called Shake Appeal before they were on Creation Records and kind of a, a shoegaze era band. Um, three or four members were, well, they probably still were Stooges fans. Oh, oh no. We, are we fro frozen? Frozen. Oh no. 
Okay, we had a bit of a tech difficulty, but we're back. Greg, you were mentioning a, a British band, right? Shake Appeal, right? Um, so yeah, the, the British band Swerve Driver were on Creation Records and a, uh, a kind of shoegaze era band. Um, I think in Temporaries of Ride, um, you know, um, maybe My Bloody Valentine. But um, as I said, I was, I was thinking Shake and Peel would be a great name for a Stooges tribute band. Um, but uh, three or four members of Swerve Driver were in an earlier band, very mm -hmm. influenced by um, the Stooges and this album, Raw Power. And they were, they went by the name of Shake and Peel. Mm. And I remember uh, even another band named Shake Appeal, an American band named Shake Appeal. Um, they were so when uh, yeah, I guess it was '97 or so. I went on a little mini tour with uh, my friends Chris and Jim and Wells. Yeah, who all of those guys have been on this program at some time. Um, just played a few different you know dates around uh, Ohio, West Virginia, DC. And, um, you know, on the road with the with the band in the van. <laughs> and, and in D.C., they played with this band called Shake Appeal. I think it was three three guys. And, uh, yeah, I thought it was really fun because there wasn't a lot of people at the club. But, but these guys, they had all these, like, kind of arena rock mannerisms. Like, they would <laughs> throw guitar picks. At the, they would completely act as if they were playing in an arena, even though they're, like, on this... <laughs> small stage and nobody's there like i like that they just refused to break character i i respected that um to the extent that when they came to chicago i went to see them again i i thought and yeah and they were nice guys it was so but anyways so yeah it's um uh, it's funny that you mentioned yet another uh shake appeal band but um the, the name has appeal yeah yeah um, um all right well yeah. shall we uh what do you think? Close, closing thoughts, guys? Um, I think we're going to blast out with the track Shake Appeal. Um, Sounds good to me. <laughs> well, do you want to play? Well, Luke wanted, um, your favorite was uh, Death Trip. So do you want to play? Um, uh, it's fine either way. Um, I think, I would say Shake Appeal is probably a good a good one to end on, you know, just because it's, you know, certainly a fitting one and, uh, and, We've been talking about the, that name, and obviously the, the name, just the name of the song, has inspired two bands to name their band after their, their band after it. So um, that's pretty cool. But uh, but yeah, as far as final thoughts, I mean, I would just say this is one of the albums I just always go back to. You know, like when you think about different things or different types of music that I get into or whatever. I mean, it always seems to be like one that I'll think of and and want to listen to a lot. So. Um, so yeah, it's one of my favorite albums of all time, and I'm glad we were able to talk about it today. Mm. Yes, certainly anyone who's interested in Iggy Pop is yeah, a good place to start. Um, not the only place to start, because the, <laughs> the other, yeah, he has a lot of amazing stuff. The other two Stooges albums are also great, right? And um, his early stuff, or his, um, yeah, some of his 70s solo stuff is pretty amazing, too. So um but yeah, if you're interested in Iggy, yeah, raw raw power, raw power, could, would be it would be a good entry point for you youngsters out there. <laughs> All right, Craig, anything in closing? Um. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, yeah. This would certainly. Um, be uh, an album worth checking out. It's it's a great <laughs> album. Um, 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 yeah, I mean, uh, the the, for the eponymous debut and Funhouse are are excellent albums as well. But yeah, this is a uh, yeah, it's a it's a, some music that uh, was ahead of its time, but still. In its time now, right? Mm. One of those timeless records. It was uh, ahead of its time to the extent that it angered people <laughs> from what it had the vibe to get from those live <laughs> recordings. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. which, is a, which is a good thing. <laughs> okay. All um, right. Well, 
Well, one, you know, I think that's too part of Iggy's provocative yeah. um, performance and, you know, yeah. stage performance at the time um, and him wanting to like make a name for themselves and make it, you know, mm. um, he was they were They were hungry. He especially. But I think the music, too, shows some other sides, too, or, you know, you know, it's even though. You know, and they said like uh, GG makes GG Allen and the murder junkies. Mm-hmm. It was all about shock. And they said, I heard some interview once, Iggy Pop said, oh, he thought GG came from the GGs and Iggy, that possibly oh. he was inspired <laughs> to, that the GG came from That's the two awesome. Gs and Iggy. But I mean, th- that kind of thing is all about, you know, shock and like, mm. you know, hostile and aggressive um and uh you know iggy pop was a provocative uh performer and the band was dealing in in loud um energetic extreme music but i think there's there's more uh you know it's not all about that there's there's more depth and you Mm. know it's a nuance and and Mm. different uh things different styles of music going on on the record i fully agree <laughs> and those silver pants same here yeah the silver pants yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. um okay all right thank you ladies and gentlemen for joining us again we're gonna go out with the track shake appeal have a great night oh there's diego Hey, Liam. <laughs> I'm sorry, Liam. Hey, Liam. Uh, okay, shake a peel. Oh. <laughs>